All right. Good. Good morning. Good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Nathan Kumar, and I'll be uh, presenting our session today. Um, and again, thanks everyone for taking their time out to join. Uh, and what we'll be focusing on is is talking about what your cloud security provider might be missing. And uh, the majority of the presentation will be focused on uh, SASE, and uh, I'm sure many of you are on this journey, you know, towards SASE, uh, and or looking to to kind of understand. Um, what vendors, um, you know, kind of meet the SASE requirements. Uh, and obviously we'll kind of go through and explain what some of those requirements are, what you should be looking uh, for in a SASE vendor. Obviously, you know, we're Cisco, so we're gonna be talking about some of our products, but in general, this should be used as guidance as far as kind of what to look for and, and what to think about as you're kind of planning, um, you know, this next phase in, in uh, you know, upgrading your network and your, your uh, cloud security solutions. So a, a thoughtful approach to SASE, you know, can really help simplify the IT environment, um, but at the same time improve security and uh, enable scalability. So those are some of the key things you should be thinking about. And during this event, we'll specifically cover three core tenants of SASE. Uh, so that being simplicity, security, scale, and scalability. Uh, and really these are the important kind of tenants you need to keep in mind when you're thinking about a, a SASE strategy for your organization. So I'll start with sim uh, simplification. So what does that mean? Um, you know, one of the questions you should be asking yourself is how can you streamline your services uh, all the way from the procurement phase to access and uh, from a management perspective all the way to enforcement? And at the same time, keeping the security mostly invisible to your users, right? The last thing we want to do, especially when we're, we're implementing a security solution, uh, is hinder the user in any way, you know, add latency, add kind of any uh, blockers that they can't get their work done. Uh, and that leads in the second point here is security. So how can you secure your users' data, devices, services? Uh, again, you know, focusing on the the data center all the way to, to the cloud uh, and also secure the way that your users not only access the cloud, but also have ways to secure, you know, the cloud solutions themselves, right? whether that's, you know, if they're using Office 365 or Salesforce ServiceNow, all those different apps also need to be secured, um, you know, when you're kind of going on this, this migration journey to SASE. And the last uh, point we, uh, that I called out earlier was scalability. So simplification is, is, is a good thing to, to start with. Security is also a good thing, but you also need to think about scale. So how do you ensure uh, the global cloud architecture that these services run on will actually scale with their business not only today, but also into the future. Uh, and that's really what we'll be talking about in the next uh, few slides here. And again, just as a reminder, um, I do have my colleague, uh, Chris Bilodeau, who's who's uh, manning our uh, Q&A today. So if you guys have any questions throughout this presentation, please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A and we'll be able to answer them um, pretty quickly. And then at the end, we'll have some time to, uh, to read out some uh, questions that you guys have sent over. So as far as today's agenda, we'll be going over a few different things today. So the, the first a topic that I, I want to cover is today's reality. So what that really means is what does your environment look like today and, and what do many of our customers' environment look like and where is, you know, where is the kind of the, the uh, transition phase to SASE going to take a lot of our customers? And also talk about some of the gaps that exist, right, from a security perspective, but also a networking perspective as well what are some of the challenges that uh, a lot of our customers are seeing? Secondly, we'll get into what to actually look for in a provider, right? That's exactly what, uh, what the title of this uh, presentation is. So what are some of the things that you should start looking for uh, to help you narrow down the, the, either the vendors, providers, partners that you're looking for as you're adding on or looking toward to adding on a, a, a SASE solution? As with any cloud service, you know, one of the things that we, that we also want to call out here is threat efficacy. So it's great that you're, you're running cloud service, it's more scalable than running traditional hardware, but you also wanna make sure it has the same level of threat efficacy, right? Can I actually block the, the bad things that I need to block in my environment? And then secondly is performance. So this is another key thing when we're talking about cloud and SaaS products is can I maintain the same level of performance uh, without affecting you know, my end users? Third point we'll go over is how to streamline management when synchronized security functions, right? So uh, do I have multiple vendors and have to manage multiple dashboards? Do I go with a single vendor solution? 
uh, where things may be a little bit more cohesive, where I only have to manage maybe one or two dashboards. Um, so those are some of the, the, the things that we'll be talking about and, and also, you know, kind of what the benefit is if you're going towards a single vendor uh, um, solution or, or single vendor uh, option. And then the, the last point is we'll be talking about Cisco Umbrella. And the reason is Umbrella is really a core part of Cisco SASE uh, architecture, right? So there's multiple uh, components that make up SASE from the networking side and the security side. And Umbrella is really a core component, uh, or you can think of it as the glue that kind of uh, stitches together both of those things, right? Um, and especially being 100% cloud delivered, um, there are a lot of uh, components that Umbrella has within it um, that can really help you kind of meet that, that those SASE criteria that you may be looking for. Again, we'll be doing a, a much more deeper dive into some of those capabilities later on. So I wanted to start by talking about what today's reality really is. And, and we, you know, a lot of you know this on the call today, right? A lot of things have fundamentally changed on how users work today. Your network is changing um, and you're probably revisiting how to, to migrate or how to update or how to, to kind of have your security architecture fit with today's environment. So the kind of the first driver for how things have shifted in the last few years are this move of applications to the cloud, right? And businesses are the number one driver for usage of, of SaaS applications or cloud applications. Um, again, I used the example before, right? If you're thinking about Salesforce, ServiceNow, uh, even platforms, AWS, uh, Google Platform, Azure, right? All of these are in the cloud and, and your users don't necessarily have to uh, backhaul traffic or even be on VPN a lot of the times now to access these cloud applications. The, the second kind of piece here is networks are transforming. So uh, prior to, you know, kind of COVID and, and a lot of focus on remote work, we did see this, this pretty steady increase in customers uh, using or moving towards an, uh, an SD-WAN approach for their branch offices, right? They said, look, we understand that uh, a lot of our, our users are, are going direct to the internet uh, and we don't need to uh, you know, pay for, we don't need to set up an architecture where we have to backhaul all traffic to, to headquarter locations. So we're gonna implement SD-WAN and then move all of the, the access uh, you know, to directly to the internet. Now, 80% of organizations either extensively or selectively already use SD-WAN in some capacity today. Uh, and because of that usage, there definitely can be a risk as well, right? You know, we may not have the same level of security that we do at our headquarter location uh, it, that, that are extended out to our branches, right? So that's a challenge that a lot of uh, enterprise customers see today. Um, and obviously the driver for that is, is this DIA or direct to internet access uh, movement. And uh, the next point here, again, very familiar, especially in 2020 and going into this year, is we're seeing a, a larger mobile workforce. More companies are supporting remote remote work and remote access for their users. And this is definitely a driver uh, for why customers are starting to look at more cloud or SaaS delivered solutions, uh, right? Because you know the traditional kind of model of users on VPN um, doesn't always work. Um, and there's definitely gaps uh, because of that insecurity. So we'll talk about what some of the, the issues are uh, when you're kind of moving towards remote work and, and how you can really shore up your security, um, you know, using different uh, kind of components here. And lastly is this, the, the challenge that we're seeing is having to maintain multiple complex products. So if you were previously just going to, to point products and saying, uh, you know, this vendor supports my cloud firewall needs, this vendor supports my CASB needs, this vendor supports my SD-WAN needs, you know, if you continue to do that, uh, it's going to get daunting for your administrators, both on the networking side and the, and the security side. So that's another thing to think, think about is, do you have the resources to continue to add on more and more products, right? Uh, and again, that's another reason why a lot of customers come to Cisco to say, what what can you offer me? Um, because I'm getting inundated with, um, you know, with multiple products and having to manage this. So it's getting very complex for me. And the last point to bring up here is with all these new kind of gaps in, uh, in, in, visit, in security that we're uh, seeing today, uh, it doesn't mean that attackers are just sitting by and, and waiting for us to you know, return to the office so they can start deploying whatever uh, kind of exploits that they, they used to be able to. There's attack vectors in more places now, right? From the cloud app side to the remote side, 
Um, users are not always backhauling, you know, using a secure VPN. Um, so there's definitely the way that attackers are um, are kind of deploying, you know, their their malware kits and things today is, is changing, right? So they're they're evolving as you're evolving your uh, security architecture. So where does where does this leave us from a security perspective, right? There's definitely some security challenges to, to think about as we're kind of on this journey. Um, and the first one is very basic and a use case that you know everyone is familiar with. Uh, first thing is setting up a security product is I need to be able to block uh, the bad stuff, right? Malware, ransomware, phishing. Um, you know, command and control, botnets, et cetera. Uh, the second kind of challenge we see is, is exactly what I just talked about. There's definitely some gaps in visibility and coverage, um, right? So you, you're, the way you're deploying and the way your users are accessing uh, applications today and the web today uh, leaves some, some gaps in, in visibility and coverage. Uh, the third point here, volume of complexity and security tools. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, especially if you've worked in a SOC, uh, or, or are part of it a security administration team where you may get inundated with just tons and tons of alerts or uh, there's just too many dashboards and, and uh, kind of nerd knobs to, to manage, especially if you're dealing with multiple products. So that can definitely be an issue, which leads into the last point. Many customers just don't have the resources to keep up with the amount of products they're having to manage and the amount of dashboards that even some single vendors have today where you have to manage three, four, five dashboards like some of our competitors do uh, to you know, to be able to configure exactly what you need to secure your users. There's also networking challenges. So I talked about what are some, you know, challenges with security, but there's definitely networking challenges to be considered as well. And, and again, something that a lot of our customers are seeing today. So one thing to call out here is the shift towards a more distributed workforce uh, it isn't a new kind of, uh, a new concept or, or a new idea, right? Um, but I would say that 2020 has definitely accelerated um, this distributed workforce. Uh, and, and we're seeing this across the board. So if you think back to, to March of last year, uh, many, many uh, organizations and companies were kind of doing this mad dash and scramble to be able to enable their users to work remotely, right? Everyone started working from home. Uh, that was an office worker. And now we have to kind of account for that, right? Um, so, you know, this trend isn't going away, um, and I think we're going to see more and more of kind of remote work and, and this concept of uh, working from anywhere. That that being said, that doesn't mean um, that the branch is going away, right? So there, there's this kind of shift in mentality from uh, protecting your headquarters and your branch to now protecting a single user, which is the you know, quote unquote, the branch of one, right? So building security around the users instead of building it around your organization. Um, but that doesn't mean that the traditional branch use cases and traditional branch offices, uh, you know, uh, kind of architecture is going away, right? We know that, you know, with vaccinations out and companies starting to, you know, uh, you know, uh, have workers come into the office either a few times a week or maybe reduce the, uh, the capacity of offices. At some point, we'll, we'll, we will start seeing this return to offices and return to, to physical locations. And we need to be able to adjust for that and then maybe you know, shift some of the focus back to branch offices, uh, but also keep the same kind of uh, components that you have for remote work, right? So it's important to have a, a, a solution architecture that gives a, a seamless way to be able to protect your users wherever they are, right? Whether they're at the airport, that is Starbucks, they're in the office, they're back at home. Um, we need to provide a seamless way to, to provide security. And you as administrators and, and uh, you know, network architects to be able to uh, provide a seamless way to manage your user security and networks as well. So th that leads to the, the question of, um, so how can we leverage you know, a simpler, more scalable method to secure, uh, securely connect your workforce to the applications that they actually need, but at the same time, ensure your organization can adapt to the next disruption to keep your people and their data uh, safe? And I understand that's a pretty daunting question, right? So the, the first uh, thing you may be asking is, you know, where do I actually start? So how can I start this journey and start to think about what I need to be adding on uh, into my environment? The typical first step in a move to SASE is really combining uh, cloud security services, right? 
So there was a, a survey that was uh, done by a group called ESG. Uh, it's a research organization. And they found that 93% of organizations agree that moving security to the cloud has actually increased their efficiency. Again, this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone on this call, right? If you think about traditional architecture, these administrators didn't have to worry about rack and stack costs. They don't have to worry about procuring hardware. Um, they don't have to worry about, you know, uh, keeping the lights on in the data center. So all of these kind of uh, things go away, but at the same time, we're providing the same level of protection that we would for those that kind of traditional architecture. Um, thus making it much more efficient, right? Because, uh, you know, the, the whole point is to kind of simplify how you're managing these different solutions. There's another survey ran that found that 76% uh, of customers want multiple capabilities in a single cloud service, uh, according to the ESG research. So if we look at what some of those capabilities are uh, that you would look for in a, a SASE vendor, right? One of them is DNS security. Uh, second one is Secure Web Gateway, or, or some of you may more be familiar with this. Uh, uh, another term is, is Web Proxy. Firewall services, obviously, you know, key capability, right? We need the ability to have some type of firewall service at, at wherever our edge is, whether that's where the user's edge is or where our branch or headquarter edge is. And then the, the last component on this list here is Cloud X Security Broker, so CASB. So I talked about at the top of the call, we also need to think about not only protecting access to the internet and access to cloud, but also have ways to protect the cloud infrastructure itself. So as your users are moving data, sharing, uh, downloading, you know, we have visibility to that and we can protect our, our users as they're kind of manipulating data within those applications. So instead of buying, you know, point solutions or looking for a vendor that has only what you, you need today, Gartner actually recommends that you start looking for a partner or vendor based on their long-term vision. So these are some of the core kind of use cases, I would say, for SASE, right? So what you should be looking for, um, you know, if you're considering a vendor that uh, says they're a SASE vendor, what are the, some of the things you should keep an eye out for? So one of them is SD-WAN. So it's definitely a core component, um, right? Understanding that a lot of work today is remote work, but again, you know, SD-WAN is really the future for, especially for delivering networking and security at, at branch locations. Firewall is a service I mentioned. So firewall is definitely, you know, core capability of, of any cloud security uh, service. CASB, we just talked about. SWG, I also mentioned. And then ZTNA or Zero Trust Network Access. Um, so if you think about vendors like, you know, Duo Security, for example. Um, so be able to provide secure access, but also uh, some type of, you know, identity uh, management as well, which is what a lot of vendors are, are starting to provide today. So really what you want to look for is, you know, choosing a leader, not only in security and threat prevention, um, but also someone that can, ha you know, have multiple capabilities from kind of a networking perspective as well. Now, only 5% of enterprises today have uh, all five of these services from a single vendor. So it, it's not a lot, right? We don't have a lot of customers right now in the market um, that are, you know, are going with a vendor that has all these different consolidated use cases figured out. But we do think that by 2023, so in a short, you know, two years, it's predicted that 20% of enterprises will work through a single vendor for, to meet all of these five use cases. So if you think about, you know, your, your peers in the market today, um, many of those enterprises will start looking towards a single vendor to consolidate these use cases and the capabilities that I just talked about. And really there's a mentality shift from, going to from best of breed to best of platform. And really the whole point of this is to drive efficiency for both networking and security teams, um, you know, particularly as vendors start to integrate across these core services, right? And beyond the technology aspect of it and providing secure access at the cloud efficiently, um, we also need to think about scale and consumption, right? We understand that different customers have different consumption needs and, and that's kind of where I would say a cloud security or a cloud service would really shine, right? Based on, you know, per user licensing or, or kind of flexible licensing models and sus subscription models. Um, cloud services are a lot more flexible that way. And at the same time, uh, can scale as your business scales, right? Uh, so you, you're gonna be looking for not only quantity of the data centers or POPs that the, those vendors have, but also their, the quality of global presence as well, right? What services do they provide? at either data centers or points of presence. So definitely something to think about 
And at the same time, what does the future outlook look look like? Right? Do they have points of presence or data centers, you know, near my locations where I need them to be? Okay. And the other component that I, I mentioned briefly at the beginning was. You want seamless connections for your users, so you want a, a consistent way of providing them, uh, you know, or redirecting their traffic and providing them uh, an experience that's really transparent to them, but works the same way wherever they are uh, in the world, right? And you also need to provide high performance to them as well, along with low latency. So these are all things that you should be looking for, um, you know, when you're, you're kind of uh, going out there and looking for, for SASE vendors. Those are very important things, especially from a cloud perspective. Like I said, we don't want to introduce any additive latency, uh, but also provide the, you know, the same level of performance that you would expect from a, a traditional kind of hardware solutions. Now, you may already be on this SASE journey, so I'm, I'm sure what I'm talking about uh, up until this point may be a review for a lot of you, or you may be kind of taking a long-term approach to this, saying, look, you know, we have kind of a three to five year plan on getting these components and use cases figured out for, for my organization, and we're kind of just start starting on this journey. Uh, so I'll just kind of summarize this section by saying, uh, wherever you are, again, you want to look for a vendor that meets a lot of your core requirements today, but also has a long-term vision of where you think you'll be or where you, you'll need to, to address uh, use cases you'll need to address in the future, right? So whether that be Zero Trust Network Access or SWG or CASB or SD-WAN, um, start looking at vendors that kind of have that long-term vision. So obviously to no surprise, uh, I, I will say that Cisco is prepared to deliver uh, on what these Gartner requirements are today, right? And we have the flexibility to meet you wherever you are today, but also um, we have a long-term vision of kind of where we want to be. Uh, and, you know, we'll kind of go over what some of those capabilities are and where we're, we're going, uh, what direction we're going from a SASE perspective uh, into the future. So I'll stay briefly on, on this uh, kind of Gartner topic for now. Um, what are customers really looking for? Uh, and one of the, the things that Gartner found is, you know, there may be uh, kind of a checklist or some way uh, that we need to simplify uh, to help customers kind of figure out what they're looking for in a vendor uh, when it comes to SASE, right? So there is a checklist um, that Gartner has where you can kind of figure out what exactly you need um, today and, and then going forward, right? And across the top here, so, you know, at a, at a high level, you want to look for a vendor that has a kind of consolidated vision. Uh, or vision, vision for consolidation, as is, I should say, for all these different capabilities and use cases. Obviously, cloud, cloud edge-based service, so you want to look for you know, a solution that's scalable, um, simple deployment, and security effectiveness. Again, two huge things when it comes to a cloud service. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about those two um, in the next few slides here. And then burstability is something we need to think about as well. So you know, how's, how is the throughput? Does it deliver the performance that I need at the right time for the services that I, I needed to deliver, uh, you know, that high performance for? And, you know, no surprise again, Cisco does check all these boxes today, right? Uh, from vision consolidation all the way to burstability, you know, we have a solution uh, or solutions in place in our roadmap that will definitely be able to meet all these different criteria when it comes to SASE. So, at the top, I mentioned kind of these three uh, concepts when it comes to SASE or three uh, criteria you should be thinking about, right? At a very, very high level, simplify, secure, and scale. A and really, Cisco can deliver on this. So, as I mentioned, sure, we check all the check boxes, um, but really, our, our kind of vision is to simplify everything, right? Whether that be from access to management, uh, the, the goal for us is to really keep it simple for both the users, but also admins as well, right? We, we don't want to introduce complexity for you as an admin or, uh, you know, architect uh, as you're, you're adding on these different capabilities. Second point here is security. So, you know, having the ability to secure users, data, devices, services, uh, again, all the way from securing data center to, to any, anything in the cloud, really. So that could be, you know, as users are accessing the cloud, or cloud applications themselves. And the last piece here is what I talked about uh, just in the last slide is optimizing performance and thinking about vendors that are able to scale for growth, right? So you don't want to be stuck with a vendor that maybe um, doesn't have all, you know, hits all the data centers you have or doesn't really have a vision for um, how they would scale at, you know, based on your business needs, right? 
And this is really Cisco SASE promise is we're bringing together networking and security functions to deliver secure connectivity in really a more integrated fashion and doing this as a service, right? We're, we're delivering SASE kind of as a service today. Now, earlier I spoke to SASE, you know, talking about increased integration uh, for both cloud and for networking, or excuse me, for networking and for security. Um, one of the things I wanted to specifically call out from a Cisco perspective is we release, recently released an industry first automation between our SD-WAN component, uh, so Cisco SD-WAN, and cloud security. And when we talk about cloud security, most of the time we're talking about Cisco umbrella. And really what we're offering is, first of all, it's a single offering that automates the connection between SD-WAN and Cisco Umbrella. So as, as organizations start to move, you know, direct internet to direct internet access, leveraging SD-WAN, um, many customers come to us and say, hey, you know, one of the requirements I'm finding with other SD-WAN vendors is I have to set up multiple tunnels. Um, you know, I'm not familiar with setting up IPv2, IPsec tunnels, for example. Um, and it's becoming a hindrance or it's taking many, many months or weeks to set up these solutions and I just don't have time for that. So we believe that this is one of the, the, the ways we can solve that challenge, right? It's about automating uh, not only the onboarding process for getting you know, our umbrella tenants onboarded with that and integrated with SD-WAN, but also automating the tunnel creation itself, which is a huge, huge um, differentiator, right? To help our customers spin up multiple locations as they need to um, so again, providing that scalability and also automating it. So making it very simple for our for our customers. So again, whether you're you know you're just starting your journey, um, you can scale. So if you have you know 10, 100, even a thousand remote sites, you can definitely leverage this integration with uh, Cisco SD-WAN and Umbrella. And just another note is our architecture or our edge, I should say, is really built from the ground up. So it's a native cloud architecture. And we're not lifting and shifting. So a lot of vendors, what they may do, if, if they're a traditional on-prem vendor, uh, they may just take you know, the, their traditional hardware, stick it in a data center and have you route through that. Uh, and that doesn't really scale over time. So we've built this, uh, our, our umbrella solution, really to be able to scale because it's, it's cloud native, right? We don't, we're not building it on top of some existing legacy hardware. So that leads me to this next uh, kind of uh, slide here which is Umbrella. So I mentioned Umbrella is, is really a core component of, of cloud security, but not only that, but Cisco SASE's kind of, uh, Cisco's SASE uh, story, right? Uh, Umbrella is really front and center. And the reason is we, first of all, there's a lot of use cases that we meet um, through integrations, but also there's many components within Umbrella today um, that you know could meet you uh, going forward uh, as you're kind of looking at other vendors, right? So I talked about some of the key components for a SASE uh, vendor. Uh, one of them was DNS, DNS security, secure up gateway, cloud delivered firewall. So these are all components that Umbrella has uh, in our product suite today. And just remember that Umbrella is, is a platform. So yes, it's a product that we sell, but it's also really a platform that has all these different components that are stitched together in a single product and managed through a single dashboard. The other components we're adding on uh, very soon actually is data loss prevention. So we're, we're providing native DLP capabilities starting with inline and then we'll look toward to adding on uh, API capabilities uh, later on. And then remote browser isolation. So this is actually something that Gartner has called out a few times as well, specifically for the SWG um, MQ is native remote browser isolation. And this is again, something we'll have inside of our, our solution very soon. So being able to isolate certain types of content, whether that's documentation, individual websites, you know, media sites, et cetera, in a kind of a clean uh, stripped down environment, right? So it doesn't affect, you know, users can do what they need to do without affecting your, your actual environment. And the last component for Umbrella that I wanted to call out here is interactive threat intel. So we have multiple ways on how we gather and share threat intelligence with not only Cisco products, but the, you know, the the greater kind of security industry. Uh, and then we also have integrations with, uh, again, not just Cisco, but third party uh, integrations as well to be able to feed in, you know, additional threat intel and automate, you know, some of the enforcement that we do in Umbrella. All of this is encompassed by SecureX. So again, if you haven't heard of SecureX, it's essentially a, a free to use platform. So if you're an existing security, Cisco security customer, 
uh, SecureX is free to use. So it's included in your license. So if you just have Umbrella, or maybe you have Umbrella, you're adding on AMP, or maybe you have it a Cisco Next Generation Firewall, SecureX is included with, uh, with that license. And basically what it does, it's a platform that actually stitches together multiple solutions in various ways. So if you have Cisco Umbrella and you have AMP and you have a firewall, um, you, you can share intelligence between those different products and also automate a lot of the, the work that you would normally have to do or manually set up, right? So if you, for example, if we step out of security for a second, let's say you have WebEx Teams, you're using that for collaboration and you want to alert an admin through a WebEx team space that, hey, Umbrella has discovered a machine that's sending out um, uh, command and control uh, traffic, right? Or it, it may be infected with a botnet. This is something you should investigate and maybe quarantine that machine. All of that can actually be automated through SecureX. So SecureX is kind of the, the orchestrator uh, or the coordinator for that. Um, and that workflow can be built in and then you can then go in and decide even further what to do with that. Maybe you want to create a ticket or, or what have you. So that's a very high level example of some of the things that SecureX can do with, with all these different products. So how does Umbrella really help, right? Yes, it's great that it has all these different components, uh, but really where does Umbrella help or, or kind of fit into this? So first of all, Umbrella, um, whether you, you have DNS layer security, which is kind of the, the core function, uh, or SIG, and when I talk about SIG, that stands for Secure Net Gateway, so SIG would encompass uh, Secure Web Gateway Services, Cloud Delivered Firewall Services, and CASB together um, on top of you know, our, what we have already with DNS. So it's, it's really uh, uh, adding on all these different services. And really what this does is however you're deploying it, uh, if you're deploying by SD-WAN, this really provides instant protection for users uh, against all types of threats, right? If we think about malware, ransomware, phishing, um, that's one of the, the things that Umbrella can provide today. And, and the second component here, especially if you're using SD-WAN, right? We provide the ability for, uh, or, or provide the visibility into traffic across your branch offices, um, and also at the same time, providing visibility to certain usage. So one of the things that Umbrella can provide with this integration is the ability to look at cloud applications. So that's a you know kind of rolled into our CASB capability. So uh, we have a dashboard called the App Discovery Dashboard in Umbrella, where uh, it basically consumes proxy logs and DNS logs automatically from your organization or your tenant as users are going through your, the Umbrella service. And then it will give you a readout or a report to say, here's all the 1,500 you know, three to 3,000 applications that are being used in your environment. And then we'll give the option to either block that, so quote unquote sanction it, uh, or uh, oh, excuse me, quote unquote, you know, mark it as unsanctioned, or if you want to allow that application to continue to be used, you can you know, uh, basically sanction that application for use. If you have Umbrella SIG, then you're adding on secure gateway capabilities and you get a little bit more granular control of those applications. So instead of just blocking or allowing, you do have the ability to, let's say um, for Dropbox, you want to control uploads or downloads from Dropbox or certain webmail clients like Gmail, for example. You have some more granular uh, capabilities to do that. Now, the other differentiator I mentioned was our automation that we have with uh, Cisco SD-WAN. Now, when we talk about Cisco SD-WAN, really what we're talking about is uh, Cisco Viptela. So this is kind of the first, uh, the SD-WAN kind of component that we rolled out um, within Cisco. And as I mentioned, you know, a lot of customers come to us and say, you know, it's been taking months or uh, way too long to get our SD-WAN infrastructure set up. With this automated provisioning and tunnel creation, you can literally get this set, get this set up in, in a number of minutes. And you know, we've actually seen uh, customers set this up fairly quickly. Uh, Cisco Viptela uh, has a, a version 17.2 uh, on, their, on their router versions. And with that version, we introduced this kind of deeper integration where we're uh, basically doing automated provisioning, so onboarding of the umbrella tenant. And then as I mentioned, by creating three templates, we also have the ability to automate tunnel creation for as many uh, locations as you need to. And all of the, the policy, the security policy itself, can be managed from Cisco Umbrella. So as soon as you have those device, those SD-WAN devices registered to Umbrella, you can then go and create individual uh, security or content policy or whatever you need to um, based on those locations. And again, all of the, the onboarding is, um, is automatic. 
and it will auto auto register API keys as well. So you don't have to go in and manually enter an API key to integrate, you know, these different solutions together. So uh, another thing we're adding on to kind of simplify onboarding and, and initial kind of management. If you're familiar with the Cisco Viptela packages, so or SD WAN packages, I should say. Um, we do have a package called DNA Premier, which is kind of the higher tier package that does include the umbrella SIG component and the, obviously the, the automation component is built into, uh, into the SD-WAN. So really what can Cisco give you, right? We've talked about a lot of the components that umbrella plus SD-WAN brings, um, but really Cisco can cover all methods to connect your people you know, to the internet. And that's really from a network perspective, uh, I'm sure, is something you care about, right? How do you actually deploy the users? Security is great, but I need to know how I can deploy my users. We support multiple ways to do that today, right? Um, you know, the other thing to think about is, is SD-WAN, the way we provided, you know, kind of the automation and tunnel creation, uh, it's very consistent, and but the, the scalability is also, you know, pretty predictable as well, right? So you can scale as you need to, uh, as much as you want, and it'll be reliable on the same kind of, uh, all the way around. And the last thing to think about is, uh, you know, kind of scalability uh, and uh, availability, right? I mentioned you not only need to think about quality of data centers, but also, uh, or excuse me, quantity of data centers, but also think about quality of data centers, right? So question one is, you know, can you scale as, as I need you to as a cloud vendor? And question two is, uh, you know, do you have reliability, right? And one of the things I can tell you is Umbrella has had fantastic uptime, even when, uh, so you know, Umbrella was was uh, previously uh, called OpenDNS, Cisco acquired it, but even in the OpenDNS days, um, we've had pretty reliable uptime, nearly 99% uptime, you know, since 2006. So as cloud adoption accelerates your internet traffic, um, does multiply fairly quickly, right? I'm sure you guys are seeing that today uh, on the call, where as your, you know, your user accessing multiple cloud applications, your volume of, of traffic is, is definitely increasing. You're not, you know, maybe you're not doing as much east-west traffic, and now you're doing more uh, internet-bound traffic. Uh, and again, that's something to think about when you're looking at vendors and how their, their you know, their, what their vision is for scalability and, and what their vision is for providing, you know, reliability, high performance, et cetera. So really what we're talking about when we, you know, discuss Cisco SASE, it, it's really born into cloud global architecture, right? So as I mentioned, Umbrella is very scalable. It was cloud native and it's built on top of microservices and a, you know, this, this concept of the multi-tenant container architecture which means that as you scale, we can scale pretty easily, right? Because we're not relying on, you know, oh shoot, we have to go and spin up another legacy device to be able to, to uh, support this customer, right? It's all scalable because of microservices and, and containerization. Agile infrastructure, something else you wanna look for in a vendor. Uh, and again, this is something that not, not a lot of vendors in the market today can, uh, can provide is high availability, uh, and also ensure that you don't have uh, downtime when you're going through our service. So one of the things I wanted to call out here is Umbrella does leverage uh, this technology called AnyConnect for both DNS and for our uh, SIG capabilities. And what AnyConnect does is essentially provide a way for you to consistently connect to our data centers, um, but at the same time, automatically provide high availability and failover. So going back to what I mentioned before, so we have this way to automate network tunnels through SD-WAN, uh, so that's great. Um, but the other thing you don't have to worry about when you're doing that is uh, high availability or worry about failover. You don't have to continue uh, to configure multiple ways to fail over. All of that is taken care of automatically as well through the umbrella infrastructure, which is great, right? That's one, of the, one less thing for you to worry about. Um, so if we have a major disruption or a data center goes down, will automatically route your traffic to the next available data center uh, in the path, right? Or, or next available data center based on location. Um, so that's definitely something that, that we provide. And this is one of the reasons why we've had nearly 100% up business uptime since 2006, because we're leveraging this technology to automatically route your traffic as soon as we see there's an issue. That's what this third point here is, proven track record. So I mentioned start even starting in, in 2006 when OpenDNS was just a DNS security company, uh, they still leverage uh, AnyConnect, and we've brought those capabilities into uh, Cisco Umbrella. And the last part here is low latency, 
So as I mentioned, one of the other things you want to look for is a vendor that you know delivers high performance, but also reduces latency. So especially with our DNS solution, which if, if you do a, a quick Google search for Umbrella DNS, you'll see it pop up as kind of one of the top recursive resolvers or DNS resolvers that you may want to switch to for performance. So one of the things is if you're using our, our, recur our you know, DNS resolvers, um, we can potentially increase your performance. And that's huge, right? If you think about we're providing security on top uh, uh, as well as being a, a, you know, providing DNS resolution, right? So that, that's huge. And we've seen across multiple customers that we've actually increased their performance as they switch to, to uh, D, uh, Umbrella DNS, um, which is you know, huge for them, um, but also good to see that uh, you know, we're really scaling with them as an enterprise solution. The other thing to call out here is from an infrastructure perspective, uh, we're not you know, renting kind of infrastructure space or anything like that from public cloud services. So this is fully built out architecture that we, we own and that we manage, and we have full control of when and where and how you know, we want to continue to scale. And that's really what brings me to this slide here, right? Is I, I talked about using AnyConnect and really our, our proven reliability um, and also performance as well. So one of the reasons why we perform very well compared to other vendors is we have over a thousand plus direct peers with various ISPs, IXPs, internet exchange points, uh, CDNs, and different SaaS platforms across the globe. And at any given point, we have around 6,000 peering sessions to create shortcuts to major ISPs to reduce you know, hop count. So if you think about um, you have a user that's in Florida and that needs to connect or it, you know, has some traffic that's uh, destined for somewhere in the UK. So using Umbrella, because of our peer relationships, we can minimize the amount of hops it takes to, to kind of get that traffic uh, over to its destination. And, and that what this really means is that we're shrinking latency and at the same time speeding up performance. So you can rest assured that you're going to get tons of security with Umbrella, but at the same time, you're going to get the performance that you, that you would expect. I talked about uh, efficacy as one of the other things to consider when you're looking at a vendor. And uh, I mentioned this is highly important, especially if you're moving to a cloud service, because uh, you know, we all know that uh, legacy kind of architecture, you know, if you think about you know, traditional kind of SWGs, um, they did provide good security, right? Or I should say great security. Um, but as you move into a cloud service, you know, a lot of customers have hesitation to say, am I gonna get the same level of efficacy and security that I previously got? So one of the things I wanted to call out for Cisco is uh, there's a group called Cisco Talos, and this is actually the largest non-government threat intelligence organization in the world uh, currently. So first of all, you can see that we have 450 plus threat research, uh, intel researchers and, and data scientists. At any given point, Talos is analyzing 1.5 million unique malware samples per day and blocking around 20 billion threats daily. That's 20X than, more, than any other vendor in the market today, and that's huge, right? If the, the amount of data that not only Umbrella sees, but all Cisco security sees is, is pretty vast. Um, and that's all great, right? The other thing to note here is Cisco Talos also feeds into uh, Umbrella, Cisco AMP, Next Generation Firewall, and, and multiple other Cisco security products. So it, it's, it's, you know, as it's gathering intelligence, it's also feeding that intelligence to all these different Cisco security products. So the other thing you'll get if you're adding on, you know, multiple Cisco security components or, or, plat or, or products uh, is kind of consistent security across the board because we're leveraging Cisco Talos as one of our intelligence uh, kind of, uh, you know, forms of, of uh, intelligence that we get. And really what this boils down to is the more that you can see, the more you can block. It's simple as that, right? The more traffic and the more kind of intelligence that we build up, we can block that and we can block it more efficiently and faster. So to that point, I wanted to kind of pull the slide up here, which uh, is about AV test. So there's a group in Germany called AV test, a third party group uh, that basically runs throughout the year, runs multiple uh, efficacy tests for various vendors. So around September, between September and October of last year, 2020, they ran a test. And this time they were interested in testing um, data security across multiple vendors but also SWG capabilities, uh, but focusing on the, the deployment this time. So uh, how well or how good is the security efficacy for vendors um, based on their endpoint clients 
that provide uh, SWG or web proxy capabilities, right? So obviously they recognize that re remote work was kind of becoming a, a, a bigger trend, especially going into 2020. Uh, and they wanted to, to see how these vendors stack up against each other. So each of these products was configured the same way. So each product had their highest level of protection enabled. And the results, uh, you know, I've been talking for 46 minutes, shouldn't be surprising. Uh, Umbrella actually came out on top here, right? If we look at the amount of malicious PE files that were sent through, malicious destinations and phishing links, uh, we were number one across the board versus, you know, other competitors or sassy, quote unquote, sassy vendors like Zscaler, Palo Alto Networks, Netscope and Akamai. Total detection rate was also higher across the board, no surprise. Um, and then our false positive rate was also uh, among the lowest uh, across all of the vendors. That's another important kind of tidbit to think about, right? So efficacy and the amount of stuff you can block is great, but you also wanna think about false positive rates. You don't wanna go with a vendor that has a high false positive rate versus detection rate, right? That could raise some red flags and cause a lot of issues down the line where users are uh, getting blocked for content they shouldn't be blocked for. If you want to access this report, we actually have this published on our site. Um, so if you go to Cisco.com or uh, the Cisco Umbrella page, public page, um, you can find this report, download it. We also um, have a, a section where it talks about the uh, DNS security testing that was done with just our, our DNS security component against some other competitors as well that AV test ran through. Um, so definitely some, some good reading material there. So really what you want to look for is, you know, first of all, a partner that, that is a proven leader, right? So a proven leader in the, in the threat security space, proven leader in, in the threat efficacy space as well. Uh, but also a vendor that kind of brings together all these different components of SASE, uh, kind of under, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, umbrella, right? One of the, the things that we're, we're looking for at Cisco is, or we're thinking about is, is really the opportunity uh, of bringing together both, you know, net operations teams and security operations team to work better together, right? We're starting to see this convergence of, of these two groups, which were traditionally siloed, you know, so net ops teams would have their own requirements. They, they're worried about, you know, getting access to users and securely accessing, uh, providing secure access to users. Security is more, you know, worried about, uh, you know, I need to protect my environment from, you know, malicious uh, actors and also from users inadvertently bringing malware or any kind of malicious content or leaving exploits open in my environment. So now with SASE and this kind of cloud convergence, where we are seeing these two separate teams also kind of kind of converge as well, right? And that really does help you as an organization. You're, you're you know, providing, uh, you're getting improved visibility and control. You're getting more collaborations between these two disparate groups. And then, you know, because you're using a more integrated model, um, it'll become more efficient and product, you know, productivity will, will become uh, a lot better as well. So what does this all look like, right? So do you want to accelerate your journey to the cloud um, and, and kind of what you would need to do to, to get there, right? So as I mentioned before, um, you know, if you're wanting to take a platform approach, a single vendor approach, uh, I talked about simple, simplicity. It's kind of the things you need to look for. Visibility, so, uh, you know, what, what kind of content uh, can the vendors see? What, what does the threat intelligence looks like? And threat efficacy as well. So, so security efficacy, they're a security vendor. Do they really live up to their, their name, right? Can they actually block the, the things that I need them to block without causing any kind of extra issues? And, and really in thinking about SASE, this is where the breadth and depth of the Cisco portfolio really comes to bear, right? Um, I talked about all the different things that not only Umbrella provides, our integrations with SD-WAN, but we have multiple other ways to provide, you know, kind of meet you in your, in your SASE journey. Uh, the other thing I mentioned is scalability. So from a technology perspective, but also, uh, you know, looking for a vendor that can scale with you from a licensing perspective and a consumption perspective, right? Uh, however you consume uh, services today is, is kind of what you, you want a vendor to, to meet you at. Um, so easy to consume packaging and consistent packaging and entitlement as well. Uh, and then, if you think about enforcement, right, you want to simplify your po policy enforcement, whether that be from a web perspective or firewall perspective, an app data protection perspective, you want a solution that kind of simplifies the way you, you do policy enforcement and you don't want to have to go through, uh, you know, 30 different options just to configure a, a content policy, right? And the last one is uh, expanding capabilities and integrations 
by leveraging APIs. And this is something that Cisco does very well, but uh, Umbrella, a Cisco Umbrella does very, very well, right? So we, we've kind of built our architecture, our solution based on the concept of, of having APIs uh, to support multiple you know, activities and multiple uh, components within Umbrella. So whether that be, I wanna pull out certain components for reporting an Umbrella, I want to uh, leverage an API that provides uh, an easy way for me to push down policy or, or do any kind of enforcement. Um, those are the things that Umbrella can provide today using our, our open APIs, uh, which is, uh, you know, any customer of Umbrella can really consume today. So with your infrastructure, you know, brought together under one banner, you can really accelerate your journey to the cloud. And that's really what we're talking about here and, and really realize the true benefits of, of SASE today uh, and tomorrow as well. And, and really what, I, what we're doing is, is delivering this kind of complete integrated solution today, right? Um, so whether that be remote working, headquarters, or branch office, um, hopefully, you know, I, I showed you or at least talked about some of the ways where we can kind of combine all these together under a single SASE architecture. And, and not only that, but under, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of a, a simplified way to, to manage these, uh, these different uh, components as well. And if that didn't convince you up until this point, uh, I'm sure you're, you're probably tired of hearing me talk at this point, but I'll kind of leave you with this. Um, if you're not convinced, right? So uh, is Cisco really up to snuff? Uh, if you look at what we protect or who we protect, so Cisco security actually protects 100% of the Fortune 100 companies. So whether that's uh, you know our, our, our Cisco umbrella, our endpoints, uh, you know advanced threat detection, firewall, across the board, we're, we're in there somewhere uh, helping our Fortune 100 companies. And by volume of customers, we are the largest security vendor in the market. So, you know, uh, and that's to say that, you know, we do have a lot of trusted customers that use our products today. And to that point, we've had over a billion dollars in cloud native investments. So we've talked a lot about SASE and kind of this journey to cloud. So just note that this is really the future and the vision for Cisco going forward, right? Is we're looking for um, to continue to accelerate our cloud native journey using you know, uh, products like Cisco Umbrella to kind of lead that and, and be in the forefront of, of the cloud and, and kind of stay ahead of, of where the market, you know, we think the market's gonna be in the next few years. And then we have a fairly large partner ecosystem as well from technical alliances all the way to our, our vast uh, kind of uh, group of, of Cisco, trusted Cisco partners to go in and provide these services for customers, whether that be you know, managed or, or, or uh, really unmanaged uh, today. So I'm going to pause there, um, and there will be some, as I mentioned, we have a couple minutes, I think, about six minutes left to talk about some uh, some Q&A. So I, I do have a few questions here um, that came through. So the first one is, uh, you know, I have Meraki. Uh, we didn't talk a ton about Meraki, but Meraki is one of the things that we're looking for right now. So I have Meraki, will this work with my MR and my MX? So those are the access point and the firewall for Meraki. And the answer is yes. So we do have an integration today with the Meraki MR for DNS redirection uh, and uh, to, to Umbrella. And then we've added on IPsec tunnel automation, just like we did with Viptela, uh, so to automate that tunnel creation uh, on the uh, Meraki MX, which is the firewall as well. So if you have Meraki, it's very much, you know, going to become or, or starting to become a part of Cisco's overall SD-WAN uh, kind of story here. There's another question about um, DLP. So will DLP be multi-mode? Um, yes, the, the answer is it definitely will be. So uh, just some kind of, to kind of uh, round that out, right? So we'll be supporting inline DLP initially, and then we'll be supporting API-based DLP going forward. Um, so those are things that we're exploring. These are all committed in our roadmap. It, you know, we're definitely looking to, to kind of add that on. Um, out of the gate, DLP will include about 80 plus data classifiers, along with the ability to create custom dictionaries to trigger DLP policy. So whether you want to create a generic policy for compliance reasons to um, enforce, you know, users sharing credit card numbers, um, or you want to get more cust you know, custom to say, I want to trigger DLP policy when these custom keywords are entered into a, a web form or some application. Those will definitely be capabilities that we'll be providing. Um, looks like there was some questions about uh, remote access. And I think Chris answered that here. So just briefly, 
Umbrella will have, and this is something that we're uh, that's in beta right now, is the ability to provide remote access services um, for uh, as part of our kind of core offering. So what that means is um, we'll provide essentially trusted direct access to uh, private applications. So uh, private applications uh, in public cloud. So whether you have a private instance of Jira or private instance of um, Salesforce, we'll be able to provide direct access to that. And then if you have any private applications or custom applications inside of data centers, um, we'll be able to provide direct access to that as well um, without needing you to set up kind of a full tunnel VPN back to your entire infrastructure. Um, so, you know, stay tuned, more details to come about what we're supporting with our remote access as a service capability. And the last question here is around endpoints. Um, so we didn't talk much about, I, I know I mentioned kind of the, the trend of, of uh, remote work. Um, so what we provide today is a standalone client. So if you have an umbrella license, the standalone client is already included in that. You don't have to buy anything additional. Um, and today the standalone client supports DNS. We are looking in the future to support more capabilities going forward. And if you are a Cisco AnyConnect customer or think about becoming a Cisco AnyConnect customer and have a license for that, um, we do have both the DNS and SWG component within a single module in AnyConnect. Um, so it makes it super simple to deploy that, you know, those capabilities out to your users. If you, if you already have AnyConnect, the only thing you need to do is just upgrade them to the, the version that's supported uh, today. All right, so I think that's my time. Um, for Thank you again, everyone, for, for joining. Thanks for all the questions. Uh, if there are questions we didn't answer, we'll, we'll definitely note that down and, and uh, get back to you folks uh, as soon as we can. And with that, uh, ML, I'll hand it back to you. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I hope you found this session informational, and uh, we hope you have a great rest of your day.